WorldMag.com presents a World Forum podcast in cooperation with Kevin Bowling, founding pastor of the Mountain Bridge Bible Fellowship, located in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina, and host of Knowing the Truth radio program. Abortion proponents are defending their own agenda against a reinvigorated pro-life movement. As part of the Knowing the Truth radio program, host Kevin Bowling and Elisa Harris, reporter for World Magazine, discuss MTV's treatment of abortion in the show 16 and Pregnant, the latest statistics regarding the national rate of abortion, and how the recent elections may impact the pro-life movement. Lisa, welcome into the Knowing the Truth radio program again. Well, thanks for having me. Tell us about your uh, yeah, your article specifically. You tell a story in the very beginning about uh, MTV, uh, a program that they have on MTV. And so uh, tell the story of what takes place there and why that's important in your article. Well, MTV um, has a show called 16 and Pregnant in which they feature young women who are pregnant and become teen mothers. So they made the decision to take one of the girls they'd featured before on that show and follow her decision as she becomes pregnant a second time and decides to get an abortion. Hmm. So it was a pretty controversial, a pretty controversial um, show when they did it. But they just follow her as she talks about it with her, with her boyfriend and with her friends and her family, and then in the aftermath of the abortion Hmm. as well. And so it was significant. just the way that they the way that they treated the issue brought out some of the pain that she felt later and and how she looked at the baby that she had just had and remembered that a bunch of cells could become that baby that she had just had it was a rather uh, sad look it wasn't it i mean the fact that she ends up going through with the abortion and uh, she expresses the pain that she feels but they they kind of indicate that that pain will lessen over time. Your article seems to indicate that the research shows that that is just not the case. Yeah, I was able to talk to Georgette Forney, and she is the co-founder of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. And, and she said that um, it would have been helpful if MTV had talked to a woman 30 years after their abortion. And uh, Georgette Forney herself had an abortion at one point, and she said that the pain continues and the after effects continue. So uh, on the program there, when they showed her, um, she was actually kind of lashing out at her boyfriend um, that that he had inadvertently referred to the baby in her womb as a thing. And uh, if I understand your article right, she then lashes out at him that this isn't just a thing. You know, this little girl that we have here now that we're celebrating her birthday, you may have considered her to be just a thing uh, when she was in the womb. But look at what has been produced here. Uh, Obviously, she wasn't just a thing. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And throughout the course of the program, you see that she has a lot of conflicting feelings about it. And on the one hand, she feels like she needs an abortion in order to provide for the first child that she had. But on the other hand... You know, it makes her very sad that she feels like she has to make this decision. Hmm. You mentioned in the article that you, and you just mentioned a moment ago as well, that you spoke with uh, Georgette Forney, um, who's the president of Anglicans for Life and uh, and co-founder of a group called Silent No More, an awareness campaign. But you mentioned that, uh, that she says in the article that uh, we have won the battle that this is a baby. Uh, many of us that have been involved in the pro-life movement for many, many years uh, would understand what we mean by that, that there was a, a period of time where many people would deny, they would just say that it was just tissue, it wasn't really a baby, it was potential human life, these types of things. But she makes a remarkable statement here. She says that we have won the battle, that it is a baby. Um, What does she credit for doing that? Well, she talks about um, just the photographic evidence that shows the life in the womb. And so we have 4D ultrasounds, and, and they, you know, show the baby really clearly and show him or her moving and, and just, um, the life that's going on in there. And so she credits um, embryoscopy and 4D ultrasounds that have just showed us more clearly um, what an unborn baby looks like. So one of the important uh, wars that have been won, if I could put it this way, you know, the um, in this battle uh, to 
protect the unborn has been at least people are now, because of the technology, the 4D ultrasounds and embryo, I think, is it embryoscopy? Is that how they say it? Embryoscopy, that because of these technologies, people can um, actually see the child in the womb moving around, and that convinces them. I know here in South Carolina there was a major push for us to uh, make the uh, viewing of the ultrasound picture part of the decision. Did you find that um, that increasing, or did you uh, you find that uh, part of the the resurgence in the pro life movement? Well, definitely. Um, part of the article is about some of the legislative um, advances that were made last year. And for instance, there were 89, I believe, 89 new reproductive health laws enacted in. in 2010, and many of them, many of them were pro-life laws, and you saw that quite a bit last year, different states pushing laws that required ultrasounds or required abortion providers to offer ultrasounds, and um, some require, required the provider to um, describe the ultrasound or offer to let the woman see it. So. The, the laws vary from state to state, but we did see a lot of states kind of pushing that last year. Mm. I found it hard to believe that in a state like South Carolina that has such a uh, conservative constituency that uh, it was just recently that we passed uh, some legislation for a longer waiting period. Um, yeah, and you need to have the state legislators, of course, but then you also need a governor who's willing to sign the legislation. So that was another another positive development for the pro-life movement that in the last election so many states switched over from Democrat to Republican in both the House, the State House, the State Senate, and in the Governor's Chair. Elisa, you um, mentioned in the article some statistics from the Guttmacher Institute. Um, talk about those statistics a little bit. Give us an idea, a little bit of a snapshot as to where we're at right now um, related to abortions nationally. Yes. Um, well, the national rate of abortion has been declining for 15 years, but the latest statistics from the Guttmacher Institute, as you mentioned, show that that rate, that, that decline has stalled. So the abortion rate actually increased slightly from 19.4 abortions per 1,000 women in 2005 to 19.6. So we're seeing a, a small increase in the abortion rate, and according, according to some research, um, that, that decline or increase in the abortion rate can really be due to the laws, the local and state laws having to do with abortion. So laws, for instance, about parental notification. Mm. The remainder of your article talks about a number of different states where the landscape concerning pro-life issues has changed. Uh, you mentioned one state here. I'll just pull out of the list. But in Pennsylvania, you mentioned it now has a pro-life governor for the first time in eight years. And so legislators are expecting uh, a look at bills uh, opting out of abortion coverage for the new health care exchange. I think the timing here as well, we're, we're, um, you know, we're in such a budget crunch on so many different issues, make it so that, um, you know, the resurgence in pro-life activity coupled with the resurgence of fiscal responsibility, it could work to our advantage to get some of this uh, funding for abortion taken out of uh, legislation. Do you agree? Yeah, I would, I would guess that as states um, face a lot of budget problems, that there, there might be an increase. Um, push to defund Planned Parenthood and to defund family planning. Um, so, for instance, in New Jersey, we saw that where Chris Christie and was uh, pushing to defund um, family planning, part, partly because their budget is in such bad shape. Mm. Um, you know, I think another thing that has happened simultaneously as well is the resurgence th- that has appeared in um, adoption. I've had uh, just recently Dan Kruver, the editor of a book on, called Reclaiming Adoption, where he looks at the theological subject of adoption and uses the theology involved in adoption, our adoption by God into the family of God, um, uses that then as a platform or a launching pad to then uh, talk about the, the physical adoption or orphan care throughout the world. 
And there seems to be a a tremendous interest in this. Uh, He's holding uh, regional conferences around the country, and uh, John Piper contributed to the book, as well as uh, uh, Richard D. Phillips down at uh, Second Press here in in Greenville, a number of others. And um, there, there seems at the same time that evangelicals are really getting involved in the adoption part of things. So hopefully all these things conspiring together and happening simultaneously will um, really result in a in a truly rejuvenated pro-life movement. Is that your sense as you talk to all these different people? We're only going over a, a short segment of your entire article on this story, but was that your sense that this is a new moment in the pro-life movement? Yeah, I would say that um, pro-lifers are very optimistic on, on a, definitely a number of fronts. And as I mentioned, the legislative one, and another front that we haven't talked about yet is also the judicial front. And the um, recent court case, Gonzalez versus Carhartt, with the Supreme Court, um, upheld a law banning partial birth abortion, and that had some language in it that pro-lifers considered very encouraging. And so, and so that's another that's another front where pro-lifers are definitely taking heart. Mm, excellent. Well, Elisa, thank you very much for writing this uh, cover story for World Magazine. I hope you're absolutely right. Uh, it's uh, entitled Babies Are Back, and I certainly hope that's the case. Uh, uh, children are the heritage of the Lord, and blessed is the man that has his quiver full of them. Uh, I have a grandson or granddaughter that's uh, about to be uh, delivered here in the next uh, week or so, and so uh, praise the Lord. I love children, and I, I, yeah, I really hope that 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 your article is correct, that there is a real resurgence among evangelicals. And and your article gets used in order to encourage them to stay in this fight and to give it a second effort here and really to make it a priority on a number of different fronts. And I think then we could really see this thing turn around. Uh, Elisa, thank you very much for uh, visiting with us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to a World Forum podcast presented by WorldMag.com, the online home of World Magazine.